Hey everybody, uh, welcome to CancelCon. Uh, my name's Doc. I'm Julie. And uh, we're going to be talking about cyanotypes today, what it uh, is, the process, some of the tools and uh, supplies that you'll need. And uh, then from there we will show you some of the process that we've done, take you through steps, and you can watch Julie make some pretty fun cyanotypes just from things around the backyard. And uh, do you have anything else you'd like to say? No. No? <laughs> I sort of talked her into uh, this, so she's told me that I will be doing a lot of the talking. Um, so, first, um, what is a cyanotype? Cyanotypes started as a way to copy blueprints quickly okay. and cheaply. Um, the emulsion is blue, that's why it's called a cyanotype, and it is exposed by sunlight or ultraviolet light. Um, and developed with water so it's super easy um, and fun. Most of the supplies we can pick up at either Freestyle? Freestyle Photo, Adorama, b &H Photo. And then if you what you can't find there you might be if you're looking for paper we can find that at like an art store or possibly Amazon or something like that. Alright let's talk about some supplies. First off we're gonna need some cyanotype chemistry, a developer tray that you can pick up at a photo shop, gloves for mixing the chemistry, a mixing bowl of sorts, and glass beakers. If you have shot glasses shot you could use shot, shot glasses. glasses work. A squeegee or credit card of some sort to strain off the water from the print, a brush to brush emulsion onto the paper. Um, simple foam cheapo brush from your arts and crafts store or the more expensive um, hockey brushes mm -hmm. for a nice even coating. Um, and that's really what, the higher the quality of the brush, the better and more even coat that you'll get. And you'll, we'll show you some examples of where chemistry will pool and you'll get different uh, reactions and deeper parts of the cyano print that you may love, like me, or you may loathe. Do you loathe them? I don't. Okay. We agree on that. An ink refill syringe to help mix chemicals if you're looking to do a small batch. A toothbrush or some sort of brush uh, that will allow you to apply the hydrogen peroxide in a more painterly fashion as opposed to just dumping it into the bath. After that, we'll need some paper cutting utensils, a straight edge or a ruler to help cut and score paper, a contact proof printer. If you don't have one of those, you can just use a piece of glass and a, a backing board. Probably a quarter inch thick piece of glass just to keep everything oh, in place yes um, and a backer board so you can transport your images once you get them arranged the way you want uh, it's a lot easier to do that sandwich everything together then take it outside as opposed to trying to arrange things in the wind difficult <laughs> um, or if you have small children like we do they will constantly come around and be like "Ooh, I want to play with this and rearrange your your prints and then you go out and what happened Arches watercolor paper is what we, we like using. You can get hot or cold press, whatever you prefer. If you like a smoother paper, hot press is your bet. If you like more of a tooth uh, to your paper. Texture, yeah. Yeah, texture. Uh, cold, press. cold press. Cold press. Hot iron smooths out your shirts. Hot press, smooth paper. And if you just want to skip this all together, just get the pre-made cyanotype paper. Today we're going to try a print on a piece of plywood, so we'll see how that goes. Then we'll grab our digital negatives or actual negatives. From there we will move on to found objects around the, the yard. We can find clovers, leaves, any type of clippings that you want to try out. Then found objects around the house, in, the, in this case a key. Alright, now that we've talked chemistry, we're going to dial in some paper. Basically, um, ripping sheets to coat and uh, I'm just gonna make this a, an even 12 by 12. It'll go in a nice frame. And the reason I'm using an X-Acto knife here is because three of the four edges were already clean cut. So I just wanted to carry that through. The next thing that we're gonna be looking at making is deckled edges. And for that, we're gonna use the Keen Cut uh, straight edge. Basically, a deckled edge is just a fancy way of saying a ripped or torn edge. Just has a completely different look and feel and aesthetic so it's just personal preference the thing that i like about the keen edge here is the feet uh, little grippers essentially that'll hold the paper nicely in place so here again just measuring once and then going to rip it twice without having to measure every single sheet of paper so uh, run your finger under it and just pre bend 
and then again just measuring once with these four sheets of paper I'm just gonna put the keen edge down with the, the rubber feet it's just gonna allow me to stay in place while I pull all four of those sheets off all right so now we're mixing our chemistry and the reason we got the uh, ink syringe earlier was if we're going to mix up smaller batches of chemistry we're going to want to use the syringe to pull out smaller amounts of chemistry to mix as opposed to using 25 milliliters per solution A and solution B. I just wanted to mix up 20 total so I just pulled 10 milliliters of each A and B solution to mix it up. All right so now we're just going to be coating paper. Uh, if you want to do it as evenly as possible and and as subdued light as possible you can do it in the day you just make sure the blinds are shut and just keeping as much as that ultraviolet out as possible once they're coated put them in a dark place to dry if you got a flat file great if you got an old MacBook box that works perfect I would recommend coating the paper at night so that it is dark and you can let them sit out and dry for a longer period of time I would suggest having two boxes, one for coated paper and one to collect all your finished pieces. Now we're in the garage. This is where the uh, exposure unit that I've built is at, along with our photo timer and our homemade dry, dry rack system. I've got an S hook connected to the spokes of the bike up there. And we run all the way over here to hooks in the shelf yeah so that's real homegrown homegrown so you can do this if the, you don't need a, the big expensive drying rack to make this happen um, this is the photo timer that I was talking about and then the, the exposure unit it's just one that was built all right so the way that this works pretty simple I've got it rigged up here to the, the timer so whenever I set the time then I flip it on, the bed lights up, and we go from there. I'm collecting plant life, weeds really, anything that I think might have a nice silhouette. Um, the more um, three-dimensional they are, um, the harder it is to sort of squish them flat. So if you have pressed flowers, that work better? Pressed flowers are good. They do tend to cook under the sun, so don't have it be something that you've loved dearly for like your grandmother pressed flowers in a book and gave it to you for your 18th birthday <laughs> <laughs> and you still have it, um, don't use that. All right, let's start gathering some roughage. Okay, all right, all right, that's enough of that. Let's move on. There's gonna be more coming up, I assure you. It'll just be process and not clipping. All right, so now we've collected all of our foliage, roughage, whatever we wanna call it, and now we just arrange them and we'll take them on outside and let the sun do the work. Typically for sunny days, you're gonna do 30 to 35 minutes if it's a cloudy day. And we're looking at closer to a three hour exposure. These are some Bradford pear blossoms from the ground up the road. Um, they're just, they've got some really nice um, veining and flower petal like stuff. These are about done. I've had them for several days, um, but they give a really nice um, textured pattern. And this um, time is sort of just sort of guessing where you're gonna put it. From bouncing around, throw a couple weights down just to get a good pressing. Um, we'll do 35 minutes. And we're baking. The 
Okay, so we're at the part of the process where we're gonna add hydrogen peroxide to the bath. Expedite the oxidation process. This is the fun part. <laughs> So now this is the part where we just sort of sit, wait for the developer and the, the hydrogen peroxide to do its thing. And once that's done, we'll put them on some glass and squeegee it, let it dry, and then we'll take it up, hang it up on the dry line. Yeah, just sort of. So let's take a look at some of the images that we've made today. Here we've got some fresh chemistry. We use some rosemary, here's some keys and some twigs. Here's a, a longer exposure. The reason we did that is to let the light penetrate the actual leaf to see if we could get some of the veins to show up in the print. Another example of long exposure. This is some uneven chemistry. You can see the pooling here. Uh, here's some older chemistry or fog, which means that it's been exposed to light over time. Um, here is uh, an overexposed, really baked in uh, to get that indigo. And here is an example that we made using our negative. And uh, so that's just an overview of the prints that we've made today. One of my favorite things to do is when you get a print that's weird, like this henpecked exposure, don't throw it away. Repurpose it. Use your imagination. Create something new and totally different. There you have it. We did it. We got through the entire cyanotype printmaking process in 30 minutes or less. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for showing up to CancelCon. I uh, mm -hmm. wish we could done this in person. Thanks Hawk for putting this all together. Amazing what you can throw together in a matter of three weeks. Thanks for everybody else that uh, jumped in, started talking about it and sharing on social media. We really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, can't wait to see what you make with Cyanotype.